Hello, everyone. Welcome to the chat room on CGTN. I'm your host today, Li Jingjing. So in this particular era, how to tackle global challenges like the pandemic, poverty, and financial crisis is a question that faces countries across the globe. But a more urgent question that needs to be addressed is how to build a fair and just system for the emerging and developing countries, how to tackle the legitimate concerns of those countries too. And this week, we have a summit that aims to find solutions to those questions. As you may know, the rotating chairmanship of the BRICS summit falls on China this year, and it will kick off this week. BRICS stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, countries with most of the world's population in different continents. And the theme of this year's BRICS summit is um, foster high quality BRICS partnership, usher in a new era for global development. So today in our today's chat room, we also hope to shine a light on those issues that I just mentioned in the beginning. And today we invited guests from those countries from different continents to share their pers perspectives on how can the BRICS continue to play its positive role in the global stage. So if you are watching this live stream on CGTN's different platforms, if you, you have any questions, any comments about BRICS, if you have any questions for our guests today, feel free to leave your comments and questions on CGTN's YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Sina Weibo, and we will try to read your comments and answer your questions later during this live stream. And without further ado, Let's meet all our guests. So now what I will do is I will introduce all our guests today one by one. And when I introduce you guys, you can introduce yourself to our viewers a little bit. Okay. So our first guest today is from Brazil, Drenado Benelupi. He's a lawyer specialized in public administration. So Drenado. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you well said, my name is Renato Penelope. I'm a doctor in public administration, lawyer in Brazil. I've been living in China for the last 12 years. So life has been good. My residence is in Wuhan and a pleasure to be here. I hope I can share a lot of what I've been following from BRICS for the last three years. Wow, you lived in China for 12 years. That's a really long yes. time. <laughs> it's a long yeah. time, <laughs> a long yeah. life here. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to continue to ask your age. <laughs> but, <laughs> you can calculate but, based on that. <laughs> yeah, but I think we also have some Chinese guests today that lived in Brazil for also quite a long time. And we will meet her later. Great. And our next guest is Elena Nehorosheva. Uh, she's from Russia. Is a master's student of St. Petersburg University. So Elena, welcome. And sorry that if I didn't pronounce your name correctly, so, Elena, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you having me here. Uh, it's all right. Well, it's hard to pronounce it even for Russian sometimes. I'm happy to be here and I hope I can share my experience, uh, not exactly on BRICS, uh, uh, and union, but probably about cultural exchange more because I've met a lot of Chinese students, uh, Indian students, uh, students from Brazil here, and I study with them. And uh, I hope to share you know, with you some uh, practical experience, you know. Ah, so where are you based now? Uh, well, I study in Russia, in St. Petersburg, but right now I'm with my friends in Belarus. Wow. Okay, so welcome, Elena. And our next guest is from India, Nayan Seth. He's the editor with the CGTN, my co-worker. So Nayan, welcome to my show. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I'm a journalist. Uh, I've been a journalist for 15 years now, and I've been working in CGTN as an editor and a consultant for the channel for four years now. So yeah, happy to be here and happy to share my thoughts uh, on the summit. Already four years, also pretty long time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's very long, but yeah, it's long enough to, to understand what's happening around me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, welcome, Nayan. 
And uh, our next guest from China, uh, her name is Cong Yi Zheng or Emer. She's a student of University of Macau. So Emer, welcome. Hi everyone, my name is Emer. Uh, I'm a FBA student of the University of Macau. I've been living in Brazil for more than 15 years and uh, keep being, uh, participating in many Sino Brazilian projects and uh, crucial exchange activities. Uh, I can share a lot with you guys today and uh, very nice to meet up with you. Okay, uh, I think you have a uh, audio problem because uh, maybe it's not your mic or the connections. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether you guys here have can hear some problem as well. It's not very clear. So you can think of it later, but I can, I, I got your message. So you lived in Brazil for 15 years. Wow. Longer yes. than Leonardo yes. living in China. That's pretty long time. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome. And also maybe take some time to fix the audio so our viewers can hear your thoughts later very well. <laughs> so, and our last but not least speaker guest today, uh, she's from Africa and her name is Hannah Ryder. She's the CEO of Development Reimagine. So Hannah, welcome. Hi, thank you very much for having me uh, on the show. Um, my introduction, I'm a Kenyan and African. I am the CEO of Development Reimagined, which is an award-winning international development consultancy. We have our headquarters in China, and we also have offices in Kenya and the UK. Uh, I'm a former diplomat and economist, 20 years of experience, including uh, five, six years in China. And uh, while I was in China, I would, I uh, did uh, lead, uh, do, several lectures for uh, the BRICS summer school, um, where I got to uh, support uh, students from BRICS countries to uh, understand the state of play on international development um, and other issues, and especially China-Africa cooperation. So great to be here, thank you. Wow, impressive, welcome. And we have so many topics, so many areas of topic to discuss today. And, uh, but first, we know like BRIC Summit is not just about dealing with the financial crisis, not just about a building system. We also tackle the global challenges that every continent, every country is facing, such like such as the uh, climate change, uh, such as uh, how to reduce, eliminate poverty, how to build gender equality, all these issues. And so first, I think we need to discuss the 2030 agenda for the sustainable development goals. So I think, uh, Hannah, you just mentioned your impressive experience uh, in, in building awareness and building friendship between China and Africa. So I'm wondering what's your thoughts on like how, how do we, how every one of us on this, uh, on this globe to understand the 2030 agenda for the sustainable development goals and how will effect, affect uh, the global, the different countries to arrange their business, their priorities? Well, so just to give a brief introduction on the, on the sustainable development goals, there are 17 of them. Um, they were agreed in, nine, in 2015 uh, by United Nations member states, and they cover every single area of life. Um, and also, thinking about the future as well. So from uh, education to water, to what we do on land, to infrastructure, innovation, it is all about, you know, how do we collectively try to ensure that all of these things are provided and that every single person in this world has these things, is entitled to have them. And I think that's what the UN agenda is really trying to recognize, um, including things like peace and security as well. Um, so, uh, and, and I should also mention climate change, which is also a very important agenda. And again, there was also a significant agreement in 2015 on climate change. So I think the key thing to begin with is really um, for people to at least familiarize themselves and definitely leaders should be very familiar with the sustainable development goals and to be aligning. Um, and this is what the UN is there to help with is to uh, help to align national goals with 
the global goals and also then adapt what the globe is doing multilaterally, including through forums like BRICS, to really try to make sure that they support sustainable development in every single country as much as they can. Mm. And also, uh, I think, Renato, do you want to share some your perspectives, your thoughts on these topics? And and uh, all my guests, today, if you feel some questions that uh, you want to share your thoughts, feel free to jump in. So I hope it can be just a, if it's a discussion, not just some get, one guest giving a speech. So feel free to jump in if you have any interesting thoughts. So that yeah. hello. Yeah, if I may take it, I'll be happy to share some words. I think Hannah made a very clear perspective. I think it's important to put all the 17 goals and also important to place it in time. So the sustainable development goals, they come in a moment where we were facing um, the Paris Agreement, like 2015, we were in a hurry. We should reduce pollution as much as we could until 2030 so we could avoid the increase of temperature by one, one Celsius and a half. So like we were fighting with this and we need like more than just like objectives, like uh, abstract objects. We need some practical ways to create a, a way to correct this, this uh, unsustainable development. So we create this development, this sustainable way to measure and work on this direction. And we also had like a very good coincidence by that time. We were developing BRICS and it was increasing our power. And we got to remember by 2008, BRICS were coming out like as just an acronym. And then like finally by 2009, we really became a block. And this block uh, kind of like come out as a hero of the, the, the economical crisis at that time. So those were the economies that could sustain the world development in, by this like period. So we added these two factors. We, we found ways to keep progressing and progressing what direction, reducing poverty, reducing starvation, reducing like uh, the crisis of living places and also like creating new ways of energy, creating new ways of reducing the impact of the carbon emission was the objective behind this all. So BRICS grow with this procedure too. And like lately more than ever, we've been embracing this like as one of our central roles, like one of the, for example, the NDB, the, the New Development Bank, the, the BRIC banks, it has one of, I mean, its main goals is infrastructure and sustainable development. So they help to finance those emerging economies, those um, ec economies in development to find ways to correct the issues that they have, which like uh, traditional banks wouldn't like support or would support them in a very bad condition. So like it's development countries helping development countries to find a sustainable way, which was also another crisis that we faced in that time when we were defining the Paris Agreement was how to avoid uh, uh, pollution or how to avoid be unsustainable, but keep developing as a developing nation because for a nation that already have developed, that has its technology, that has its own procedure was fine. But for us that we still need to develop you cannot do a lot of the things that you're supposed to do to develop. It became hard. But now we have these tools. We have these conditions to exchange technology, exchange ideas, and also exchange manners and conditions and measurements to, to get to where we want, to like a sustainable future and maybe avoid this increase of temperature. Mm. So um, I want to ask you another question because uh, you mentioned like <laughs> breaks came, when it came out. It sounds like a hero and developed into a block um, in over in recent years. I'm wondering what's your thoughts on the on the benefits that BRICS had brought to different parts of the world, especially you're from Brazil. Can you share from like a Brazilian perspective, what kind of um, positive role, positive benefit that BRICS had brought to the global south? Well, like uh, we cannot deny that, like before BRICS is like rise as a block, uh, we had no much of a representative power. We have no like uh, multilateral block, and I think like the first step that BRICS, uh, when it consolidated itself in two thousand nine as a group, as like a dialogue partnership was to launch a voice for the emerging countries. I think the second step was more to be inclusive, as it's so. 2010, we already worked to include the S on our C, like an acronym to like put South Africa on it. So uh, I think 
what BRICS has been working on, it's like how to create a voice for the developing nations. So developing nations need to have a support, to have a louder voice. G20 was also from the time, but like uh, what we find in BRICS is like somebody that's developing is finding its way and everybody look at like, yeah, those are powering nations. So I think the benefit that we are bringing is, for example, finding solutions for issues like weaponization of finance. So like most recently, Russia, for example, it proposed a project called AR, which like it found that like all the countries from BRICS, the, the currency starts with R, rupee, rendi, real, RMB, and uh, ruble. So like they propose like uh, a way to make exchange of currency between these nations without using dollars. So bypassing dollar and avoid the risk of the weaponization of dollar. So this can give us like more like uh, peace, let's say, like a peace on exchange, a, 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 a uh, stable way to keep our business flowing and our conditions to develop our nations flowing. We also are finding a lot of projects to develop research and development, technology exchange and industry. So we are creating maybe even a carbon credit common ground, like China is like the biggest carbon credits already. So I think that's the reference that the BRICS are bringing. Mm, thank you. And also, um... As you mentioned, this is a, a great way to deal with the financial problem that especially the Global South are facing. And uh, I'm wondering, does the BRICS bring any benefits for the young entrepreneurs to create their business or, um, e or if, for example, e-commerce? Does it like uh, any benefits that it brought to the young entrepreneurs in those countries, in the Global South? Um, I can, maybe this, I can pass this question to Elena or Nayan. Do you want to jump in to share your thoughts? Well, I, I can definitely share the student experience, how the st student environment work, uh, works mm -hmm. inside breaks, maybe not inside the breaks, but with uh, countries uh, that uh, BRICS includes. For example, we have a lot of uh, students from China, Brazil, India, uh, South Africa, and I see them every day. Like I communicate with them. I have my uh, group mates, like people. Uh, they are not, you know, like abstract people. These are the people I study with, I work with, I, I talk to. And um, that's where the cooperation starts, I guess. Uh, it's great that uh, it... Uh, no, it involves not only like business or uh, not only um, governmental spheres and organizations, but also students. And uh, I guess that it's, um, I really um, appreciate that it's not that hard, you know, to take part in the some exchange programs and to see what, uh, what uh, BRICS is, uh, what the people are, and to, to share the experience because um, I really, I really believe that cultural uh, exchange is important. It's important if you work with people from other countries, if you are, um, if you deal with international business, uh, international society, like you need to be aware of another culture and culture uh, is people. So you need to know people, you need to communicate uh, with them. And it's great that we have such an opportunity. Mm, indeed, cultural, cultural, uh, exchange is very important for each of us yeah. from, different, from different countries to understand each other. So that will reduce all the discrimination or all these uh, filters we used to have because just simply because we didn't understand. But yes, like you mentioned, it's very important. But um, Nayan, I have a question uh, for you yeah. because you know, you know, I'm very active on, on Twitter. So I recently, I do have a lot of people um, not just from India, also from China, from different parts of the world uh, that live in comments saying they are asking for more cooperations between China and India or our countries. So I'm wondering, um, can you in, uh, tell our view viewers what kind of cooperations between our two countries uh, are, are right, already there under the bricks and what kind of benefits it will bring to not just our two countries, actually to the whole Eurasia or the whole yeah. uh, emerging economies. Yeah, 
I just want to start with my personal experience first because uh, when I when I decided to come to China, a lot of people in India asked me why China, and I was like, why not China? <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, you know, in, that's a it's a pity that we are neighbors, but uh, you know, for an average uh, Indian, uh, they do not really know much about China and what's happening in China. Uh, I would say partly is to be blamed with, with the media coverage uh, and also. Uh, the links between our governments have been increasing now, but historically uh, they were strong in the 50s and the 60s. But there was a there was a period of, of 30 to 40 years where we didn't hear much from each other. So uh, yes, uh, talking about your question, I think both India and China, despite their uh, their uh, bilateral differences, have been uh, cooperating under the BRICS framework uh, for for some time now. Uh, for example, I think the biggest example would be. The formation of the new development bank, uh, where it is, it's a bank. It was the first bank created by the developing nations, and uh, it is, uh, it has its headquarters in Shanghai. And the first chairman of the bank uh, was an Indian uh, veteran banker called K. V. Kamat. Uh, apart from that, if you remember, in 2008 during the financial crisis, India and China led the BRICS uh, in in uh, deciding and finalizing their recommendations for, for global governance for G20 and World Bank and IMF, which were later adopted. Uh, in 2015, uh, during the, the Paris Climate uh, Summit, India and China practically led the developing world in, in negotiating uh, terms and conditions of that agreement, which, wo which was a landmark, uh, which still is a landmark agreement. Uh, and recently, if you look at during the pandemic, both India and China supplied millions of doses uh, to developing countries. Uh, and even under the BRICS, uh, recently they have launched a, a vaccine research and development center, and there are regional centers being created in each of the member states. So countries like India and China, yes, they are, there are issues bilaterally, but under BRICS, uh, the common there are common goals uh, for for these two countries. Uh, they are they are working towards a common agenda, which is of course tackling climate change, reducing hunger, uh, and and uh, and uh, you know go, moving towards uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals 2030. So I think the future is bright uh, in terms of because yes there are challenges. Of course, uh, India and China in their own economies face challenges right now. Uh, but I think there is an inclination in these two countries to move forward. And also, our two countries have independent foreign policies. Uh, they do not want to be boxed into one corner or the other. Uh, so I think that's very important when we talk about BRICS, because BRICS has the potential. And I think it has been doing that, but it has the potential to become the voice of, uh, of the Global South uh, in all respects. Mm. And so when, when BRICS uh created it was uh yeah. like uh it's very clear it's not it's not alignment between these countries so yeah. it's not a political system that parts any other third parties or or different countries or the western countries it's very clear these countries come together because we are from developing we are developing countries and we want to uh work together for our mutual benefits benefit the emerging developing country that benefit the global south and like you mentioned even though china and india have disputes on some issues yeah. but it never stops these two countries to work together to to yeah. deal with all this uh, economy uh crisis financial crisis so i mean from the experience we are very clear even though we have we come from different culture different backgrounds different continents we have disputes on some issues but still we work together for a common goal because this is a system that will benefit everyone of the us especially um people from the global south that has been neglected for a pretty long time so it's time that we fight for our what we will consider what's in the best interest for us, right? <laughs> so um, yeah, and also uh, like uh, the the other question, I think because our countries have large population, two largest <laughs> largest populations in the world. So a lot of people are saying if China and India work together, it will benefit the whole Eur Eurasia. So it will be a different Eurasia. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, you if you look at 
how India and China, uh, I mean, of course, we have resources, we have population, we have 2.8 billion people on, on planet Earth. And uh, I think under BRICS format, lately what we have seen, for example, the BRICS Plus uh, and, and, and other, um, you know, talk about expanding the BRICS, you have, you have Kazakhstan joining uh, for, for a foreign minister's meeting recently. Uh, so I think uh, the Global South as, as, as an entity in, in different continents, uh, I think BRICS has a major role to play and India and China, because they are the leading, they are the founding members of, of this group, uh, uh, have, have a major role to play in terms of providing one, the framework of, of how to, to, to go about in terms of uh, development goals, the infrastructure development under the NB, NDB. Uh, you have new members coming in the NDB recently in 2021. You have Bangladesh, UAE, and, and others. So I think uh, India and China have more of a, a nudging role to play. And more, you know, more members would also mean uh, more financing for projects uh, in Eurasia, in countries which have been shut out of, of the global conversation, as you said, for very long. And uh, high time we have a voice. And you know, these countries, they are, they are looking of, to be not in any, any camp or any ideological block. They are looking for, for problems of today of development, of, of lifting their people out of poverty, providing clean drinking water uh, and, and so on, and reducing uh, pollution in, in their cities and, and countries. So I think in that manner, India and China have a huge role and they are playing a role uh, in the recent past. And, and given what we are hearing about this summit as well, uh, I think uh, we, have, we will have a framework uh, coming out of this uh, soon. Mm, thank you, Nayan. And uh, I think I have a question for Hannah again, because I'm wondering from an African perspective, um, I mean, of course, China and, and Africa's uh, and different African countries' relationship have been growing steadily in the uh, re in recent years. I'm wondering, of, uh, of course, I know you're from, from Kenya, but uh, um, I, I hope you can share your observations that uh, different countries in Africa, including South Africa, how did they benefit from this BRICS system? And any improvements over these years? Yeah, so um, I guess, I guess when it's important to put the BRICS into historical context, right? And also, you know, why is South Africa part of the BRICS and not other African countries? And what does that mean? Um, so I think number one, you know, before BRICS, historically, the majority of kind of groups uh, who would work together or kind of coordinate together, meet together, we had G8, which then became G7. Um, and then there were other big groups like G77. There was, um, there was a small island developing states, but there were generally all regional groups, you know, Africa group, et cetera. But they were generally not necessarily kind of, they were generally very big, but not, um, but, but also very regionally based or had some very clear commonality. Now, what BRICS introduced was something a bit different, a recognition that there are other kinds of configurations that, for example, you know, five countries that really do have very different kinds of economies. I mean, you know, we're talking about China, India kind of moving GDP growth, you know, yes, China's having some challenges right now, but South Africa has been going through a recession for the last kind of four or five years, et cetera. Um, and, where, and Brazil also having significant challenges. So it, there are quite different economies, also very different political systems. But the, com the commonality is that they also have significant power. They're emerging kind of politically in, geopolitic in geopolitical terms, in economic terms versus the rest of the world. So that kind of, the fact that that kind of exists is also very interesting and, and important um, for, to, to recognize. And those commonalities even if you've got other kinds of differences, the commonalities also can be recognized. So for example, again, talking about China and India, China, and if we're talking about COVID-19, for instance, China and India both have large pharmaceutical industries, right? But they've come in, they've grown in very different ways. 
Um, but that exchange of experience, the exchange of, you know, their approach to financing the pharmaceutical industry or financing infrastructure, et cetera, all of these different things can actually offer uh, both not only themselves useful lessons, but also to the rest of the world. And so I think that is something which I think, to be honest, I think BRICS has not necessarily, necessarily so far taken advantage of that enough. I think there's much more to do. Definitely the New Development Bank is a, is a really great step in that direction. And we also see the New Development Bank also progressing itself. It's also, its strategy is also continuing to emerge. It's starting to, to move beyond the, just the, the initial membership of the BRICS, um, which is very welcome. Uh, but then there's, there's definitely much more that can be done. And I think, um, African countries, not only South Africa, but African countries actually really starting to understand the different systems and ways of delivery, policy delivery, the way different, uh, the different uh, economies, uh, their economic experience, historic experience um, has, has gone in, uh, in the BRICS countries can be very useful. It doesn't mean they have to copy them, but actually having that awareness of the potential and where the challenges have been, where the progress has been, um, can be extremely useful uh, for, for going forwards. Hmm. Uh, Hannah, um, you mentioned yeah. that African, African countries have been realized the, the different countries can deliver, uh, the different different countries, different with different political system can deliver um, their promises or, or their goals. And uh, can, can, can you uh, elaborate on that? <laughs> Well, I mean, take also, take an example. Yeah, take an example on on climate change, for instance, right? Um, now, and and a country like China. China has a political system, which means that when China has agreed a particular climate change target and a climate change goal, that is a goal which will be addressed. Now, from the rest of from the rest of the world, that goal may not seem you know, super ambitious, or it might seem ambitious, but slightly kind of drawn back. But there's other countries that have the approach where they will set an ambitious goal, but they won't know how to achieve it and may actually never achieve it. Mm -hmm. So there's pros and cons to doing different things. And there's different, there's pros and cons to different political systems and ways of organizing these things. And I think the fact is, is that countries should have the choice, countries should have an awareness of what the choices are, um, as they develop to understand also what is in their interest. And again, India has another completely different approach. Brazil has a completely different approach, but again, through coordination, through understanding each other, and then also sharing that experience with others and saying, we've got these differences, but it also, we still have these common goals. I think that can be quite powerful. Mm. I'm also wondering what are the challenges that African, African countries are facing in terms of becoming more like richer and uh, dealing with uh, crisis like climate change, reducing poverty. So from an African perspective. Yeah, well, and again, the, the issues that BRICS are, are talking about, are wondering about, are also coordinating about. Um, uh, Renato talked about currency. Um, uh, these are exactly the same challenges that African countries face. I mean, if you look at what we have now, the, the African continent has got the African continental free trade area, which South Africa is part of. And, uh, and is a very integral member to it and actually was really promoting it through the presidency of the African Union. Um, look, with one of the key elements of the African continental free trade area is an is a, is a element to also have a, a, a similar currencies or even at least mechanisms to avoid having to go through uh, other currencies to then convert, et cetera, et cetera, because it's costly and it's inefficient. So the kinds of issues that BRICS are discussing are also being discussed in other regions. And so if BRICS are successful in doing what they, are, what they would like to do, then it also encourages African countries or other regions to be able to say, well, maybe we can also do it. And they can also see and understand like, well, that went wrong, but this did, this didn't or whatever. And, and it can be, it can be that kind of, they can help shape the future. Mm. Renato, Thank I think you. wants to come in there as well. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm nodding. Yeah, if I may, I'm going to make a short like cut on this. Like uh, yeah. what, what I like a lot and I hear like really strong and make me happy is like, in fact, what we see in BRICS 
we have like this five different civilizations, basically. You have like China civilization, you have like the Indian civilization, you have like the Russian civilizations, the African, South African, that's like a lot of different civilizations in South Africa. And then you have Brazil with its own civilization in process of development. So it's really multipolar that's rising. And with this political, local or like international involvement at each country, you get Brazil, for example, the first eight years, Brazil was deep in the bricks. And then suddenly we had like a straight alignment with the US, but even though we have the now the president of the NDB, the, the, the BRICS Bank, like Marco Trojo, like he's Brazilian. So like we still involve it. So this tool is so important that even when the political dynamic changes, we still own. So like it's beautiful how we we actually we understand each other in a way that we keep involved, we keep like exchanging. I think that's what I, I have to share. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate these perspectives from the global south, from from Africa, from from Latin America, and I remember the quote from the uh, famous historian Michael Parenti. He said, uh, with a picture of um, the map of African continent and uh, Latin America and Central Ameri America uh, continent, saying these countries are not poor. These countries are rich. Uh, the people are poor and uh, they are not underdeveloped they are overexploited and um, um re uh, bring this up not just like okay we moved on we are now lingering to the past but i think we have to think why these countries are so rich and uh they can come up with a, a, a solution that's in the best interest for themselves so they can develop choose the best way <laughs> to develop themselves so yeah and, and that's why this is the purpose this is the aim of BRICS summit that all these developing economies come together and we find solutions to for a better future for ourselves and um we have two guests that have been waiting for us for so long uh Imer and Elena sorry sorry to keep you guys waiting and we talk about so much about uh, finance, economy, <laughs> but Imer, you mentioned in the beginning that, and also Elena, you both mentioned that cultural exchanges are very important for people from different um, culture, different countries to understand each other. And you guys, I think the perfect example to build bridges between people in different cultures. So Imer, um, how's your mic now? Can I say something? Uh, Let's yeah, make test. Uh, can you say more? <laughs> you want one complete uh, sentence? Uh, hello, can you hear me? It's okay? Yes, much better. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, we can't wait you. to hear from you. <laughs> so, okay, you've been living in Brazil for 15 years. That's pretty long time. So yeah, you studied in my Brazil? Life. Yeah, I studied, uh, I studied in Uh oh, I have some technical. Oh, I would go there. Huh? Oh, you froze for like a few seconds. Oh, sorry, and sorry. So you just missed the part that's okay. why you were there. <laughs> sorry. It's okay, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you've uh, been okay. studying for in, in Brazil for a pretty long time? Yeah, for a pretty long time, like uh, high school until high school. And then I'm studying in University of Macau now, but Due to the pandemic, I'm stuck now in Brazil. So, yeah, attending the online classes. But yeah. So, can you share some your observations of how the young people from this BRICS country and your experience from uh, young people from China and Brazil, uh, how do they benefit from the BRICS summit? Are there any cultural exchanges between uh, for for the young people for these two countries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as Nayan mentioned before, Nayan, right? <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong with the name, but like uh, in between China and India, the Chinese people and Indian people, they don't know each other too much. And then you can see this situation in Brazil more serious. Maybe Renato will know about that too. Like uh, China and Brazil, they are on the other side of the world. So there will be a lot of mis misunderstanding and uh, familiarities. So um, I realized that how important to both parties comprehending each other 
like uh, with the Sino Brazil activities are really helpful, and also the the BRICS uh, projects, the multinational activities, and all the initiatives, they contribute a lot to the mutual understanding between the people from uh, different countries. That is especially for the young people that they can have a clear image about the other countries' realities, the business models by talking directly with the uh, native people from there. So uh, the uh, participant, the young businessman will find out oh, what and how they can contribute for the cross country cooperation and uh, where are the opportunities. So I think it's essential for the further development of the BRICS economics too. And also, uh, for example, in my own uh, experience. So in the cultural perspective, I participated in the uh, organization of the Chinese Film Festival in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. So uh, oh. which we have the sixth one at the end of last year. It presents Chinese modern films uh, with bilingual subtitles. So we'll give the Brazilian people insights into the Chinese culture. So I think that is also really important to the culture exchange. Uh, and also in the daily news as correspondent uh, reporter, I participated in a pro uh, broadcast program produced by CCTV in partnership with a Brazilian media band news called Mundo China. Yeah, there uh, where we will demonstrate China in the uh, politic, uh, economic and the cultural aspect from the native perspective. And always I can hear from my Brazilian friends that, oh, how do the medias or from what they imagined before about China? So, uh, and vice versa, this impact also can, can be seen from the uh, Chinese side. So when our research team of uh, Tsinghua University was visiting Brazil, a student told me that, well, she was so impressed to see the real Brazilian daily life that she couldn't know due to the language barrier and uh, the long distance. So I think the comprehension and the understanding are really fundamental to the, the different countries' cooperation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, and also, I was going to that if, if, you, if you talk about in company and investment opportunities, and also transnational employment opportunities to the young generation. So I think uh, it's really important we know the, about the both country, what is the advantages? Like for example, in case of Brazil and China, like in Brazil there are resources as minerals, uh, grains, corn, soybean, and meat that everybody knows. And uh, in China, there are uh, advanced technologies uh, develop logistics and e-commerce platforms. So there are various and diverse areas that can promote corporations, uh, principally uh, by the rise of the e-commerce scenario that we, we are living now. So yeah, the corporation will inter, uh, intens, incentivize, also facilitate all the internship too. Mm -hmm. Wow, and so many different projects. And you also brought movies, <laughs> movies, movies to Brazil. Yeah, that's pretty that's impressive. Me. And you mentioned there's some, mm, how to say, uh, not misconception, not misconception, just like most probably misunderstanding. Or... Yeah, be, due to the lack of communication, uh, many Brazilians probably just don't know what Chinese, Chinese people, what Chinese cultures are like. And Renato, do you find the same thing when you're living in China? Do you say like because it's the same? Like Chinese people probably don't understand Brazilian culture, Brazilian people that much, right? Did you find the same thing? No doubt. I gotta tell you just one thing. I think there's two challenges that we gotta face when we see Brazil and China. In between Brazil and China, there's the whole world. So like <laughs> that, that's already a lot. Yeah. yeah, the whole yeah, the like other side of the world. Yeah. yeah, we're totally the opposite. So language, culture, all the nations in the world. So it's really a lot. And actually in, Be in Beijing, there's a movie festival, Brazilian movie festival. They also put subtitles. I think it's a good way to dialogue. Culture really yeah. plays important role. And we want to sell more than commodities. And that's why I think like what culture can help and like uh, nature also can be a thing. So yeah, she has a good point. I agree with her.
<laughs> okay. And I think it's probably on you. You have a mission to introduce more Brazilian culture to the Chinese people here, right? <laughs> Living here for 12 years, it's your responsibility now. <laughs> homework, homework, daily life. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I like. I find it interesting. Earlier, before the live live show, I somehow recently I've gained a lot of Brazilian followers on social networks. And, huh? <laughs> so I don't know what happened, but suddenly a lot of Brazilian followers uh, was like, "Oh, I'm interested to get to know Chinese news." And I remember just this afternoon, I saw comments from Brazilian user. Wow, the Twitter, uh, the Chinese Twitter are so based. So they agree with what I tweeted. So like, I find it very interesting. Yeah, Brazilians are high connected to the internet. And like when somebody's doing a good job, we follow, especially a good voice for the South South Global, like voice like <laughs> yours is like, we are, oh, we are catching you. up. We are, we are getting on you. <laughs> well, uh, how long, how long is the flight between the two countries? Like uh, 30 hours or something? Because you have to transfer, right? Combine probably over 30 hours. Yeah, I think it's around 30 hours, but I think it's more longer now uh, due to the <laughs> pandemic. Yeah, yeah there's no week. more flights. <laughs> no, like flights. Just few flights, so you need to transfer twice or more, yeah. Mm. Yeah, before and it used to take around 26 to 34 hours, depends on this, like, the, uh, the stop you make it. Is that the reason that you guys been living in... China and Brazil for like 12, 12, 15 years. So like, I just don't want to take the flight to fly all the way to another continent. I so used I'm to like more the airplane than my house. <laughs> <laughs> and even you need to, uh, do the time zone difference, I think 11 hours, right? You need to uh, get used to it. And you will spend a whole week to, 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 to get used to it, the time zone difference. That's really tired too. <laughs> And uh, we have, uh, where's our, Elena, are you still with us? You? Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, sorry, <laughs> we've been chatting for so long. So, <laughs> I mean, you interacted with international students uh, from different countries, right? I mean, um, what's your advice or questions? Do you feel the same that, uh, like what uh, Imer just said? Uh, well, what's my advice for uh, for people uh, is to be be open, I guess, is to be tolerant, to um, to try to understand uh, another culture, uh, and to, to get get to know it because uh, it's interesting. We have we are at the same time we are so. Mm, it's the same like we are all the people we have although we have yeah like different uh, economics but we have some something in common and at the same time we're so different and it's so interesting so we need to to realize yet yeah, understand those differences and to mm, to get to, to know them you know mm. and you know do you feel that people also need to probably need to interact with more Russian people in real life to Definitely. get to yeah. understand Russian culture, Russian people, because it's Russian people are not what the Hollywood film portrays because they're always being, yeah. you know, right? <laughs> and yeah, and the Chinese, Brazilian, South African people are not what the films betray, like uh, portray. Uh, so that's why we need to communicate. We don't need to like watch and read. So well, like we need to watch and read uh, something, but we need to, to experience it uh, ourselves. Mm. And uh, actually, my editor just sent a lot of comments from people who watched, who is what, who are watching this live stream now. So let me read a few comments, okay? Mm. Okay, so from YouTube, this uh, user is called Yunus. We are expected a lot from BRICS. It will be a solution for Ethiopia and Africa. Mm. Mm, so I guess this user is from Ethiopia. Um, and we have another user, Muhammad Ayub uh, from Facebook. He said, 
Yes, BRICS can play a role model for the rest of the whole world. Through this organization, crisis can be solved. Hmm. Very nice comment. How oh, we got a really long comment from Facebook, Hoi Meng. Um, sustainable development can only be achieved uh, if the respective countries has are aligned in agreement to put the vision plans into actions, not only words alone. So to put, to avoid pollution, auto, automobile industry should go into hybrid electric cars. Industries can industries be fitted with exhaust pollution gadgets. Cooperations between member nations in going to uh, green farming and enable a financing package at favorable, affordable rates, aiding the farming industry. Wow, this, this user gave a lot of advices. And we have uh, Anti Lele, would love to know more about bricks. And we have a lot more comments from Facebook and YouTube. Uh, but unfortunately, we have we only have 10 minutes left for our live stream this time. So uh, I'm wondering, maybe each of our guests can share their perspective um, on this final question. Like, how do you see BRICS in the future? What does it mean to the developing countries? Or how it can can it help the South South nations to cooperate with each other? So I, I know I just mentioned like three questions, but choose whichever questions you want to answer, you want to share your thoughts on. So how about we start from Brazil? Renato, your turn. <laughs> All right, so I'll take the lead. Um, well, that's a tough question. Like what I see bricks in the future, I think it's the the first step of a big change that the world needs, as we saw already, like it was all colonized countries, countries that like were rich before are rich now. And like they could be richer, like in the future, I think it will be more inclusive, will be more, you know, uh, we will have a shared future. I think we will share prosperity. We will have like clean energy. I think that's where this is the clear direction that the BRICS are working on. Like, you know, there's a strong financing for those, for infrastructure, for for like sustainable development. So the idea is to create education, to interconnect this multi-civilizational like, you know, world civilization. So I think that's what BRIC is already, this step for the change for this like, this, this direction. I think the direction of change, it's already done. So it can like delay a bit, it can go quicker sometimes, but it's gonna keep marching to the future. So I'm very proud to be part of it. Like I'm glad to be seeing these, there's like this BRIC plus, a lot of countries jumping in. So mm -hmm. yeah, let's build this like this shared future. Yeah, you just mentioned something very, very important. Yes, this year is not just BRICS, it's BRICS plus. Uh, dozens yeah. of countries joined, not into this uh, organization officially, but as an observer, and they are all emerging developing economies and they are joining these BRICS banks as well. So a promising future for emerging economies. <laughs> and next from Russia, Elena, what's your thoughts? Elena, are you still with yes. us? Yeah, today. I'm um, yeah. sorry, your connection is so not. Sometimes the connection ready. is bad, but I really like the phrase. Uh, Elena? Elena? Oh. All right, so can you uh, hear me now? Um, but I your footage is not moving. So how about I'll come back to you later? Maybe after not yet. India, your turn. <laughs> okay. Um I mean these are pretty pretty big questions, I would say, but yeah, I mean um, a lot will depend on how our individual economies fare. Uh, because we are themselves, we, we ourselves are facing a lot of challenges right now. Uh, yes, BRICS Plus is, is, uh, is an important step forward. Uh, but I think what, what uh, countries like India, China, Brazil, Russia, they can do is use their strengths. Uh, for example, China can build 
and it has proven over, over years that it can. So use that uh, through, through BRICS mechanisms and, uh, and, and advanced development uh, goals. Like India can, uh, in terms of software development, in terms of providing online training, India is, is, is uh, a leader or one of the biggest countries who can do that. So I think uh, BRICS countries would need to, to, of course, look at themselves, uh, grow their economies, and at the same time advance uh, multilateralism, oppose protectionism, and uh, in a polarized world like today, I think the role of BRICS is, is more important than ever before. And uh, the future is bright, but of course it's very challenging. Yeah. Thank you, Nayan. Nana, how's your connection now? Uh, it's better, I guess. Uh, and yeah. I'd like to say that I I really like the phrase that someone said today that uh, Prix is the voice, the voice of emerging countries, and uh, that everyone can hear this voice and can pay attention to that, uh, because our our countries are really rich, so we have so much, so many resources, so many people, and people potential, so pe really talented people. I can see that by myself. So mostly among students and i can see that people are really talented and we have this uh, potential and we need to you know, be represented on the world arena and i guess um, by cooperating by working together by sharing our experience technologies here yeah, because some have resources some have technologies and by working together uh, we can really achieve uh, like achieve the sustainable development the goals that we have in mind um, it won't be easy i guess so it, it will be hard work it will be challenging but if we work together we can mm, thank you elena and uh, imer yes can you hear me yeah okay so um, I think that BRICS will get like uh, rise uh, increasingly important in the future, uh, especially during and after the pandemic era. So that some um, uh, new problems and ch uh, challenges ap will appear, but also there will be more innovative industries emerging. And I believe that will be new solutions to face those challenges too. And uh, BRICS, as having more than 40% of the world population, uh, expects that the practices and the corporations will promote uh, the global economic recovery um, and also can be viewed as a sign of direction of the other countries, too. Mm. Thank you. And Hannah? Well, I think, you know, we're going through some very, very difficult times and, and there is a lot to learn from each other and to do. Um, you know, we have war, we have food and energy security crises, there's supply chain crises, trade crises, and so on, you know? And I think it's it's easy to kind of fall into the, into the idea, well, well, BRICS are gonna get together and either they're gonna do nothing or they will, you know, just get together for a nice photograph or they will, you know, provide some finance, pledge some finance to help others meet the SDGs. And, and of course that's important, but I think um, perhaps, and given, given the kind of difficult times that we're in, uh, I think it's, it's, it's important not to just get together. It's really important for the, for the BRIC space to be a space in which there is uh, understanding and also a safe space for, for, for challenge, you know, allowing mm -hmm. listening, discussion between countries that actually really respect each other. I mean, that's also one interesting aspect of BRICS. These are countries that respect each other. They're not necessarily allies. Um, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not, but they have a deep respect. Um, and I think that's really important at leadership levels because that's what can actually unlock, uh, unlock challenges. And I think, you know, for example, even South Africa has significant experience, things like truth and reconciliation, after apartheid, you know, that has been very, that's very relevant uh, these days um, for, for even the challenges that we're facing with Russia and Ukraine, for instance. So, you know, and similarly, you know, Chinese experience of, of reducing coal consumption, we were talking about climate change earlier, um, very crucial also for South Africa to avoid um, pollution, to avoid those kinds of, those kinds of challenges. So I hope, 
that the summit um, and also future summits will provide that kind of uh, safe space, as it were. Um, it can provide the opportunity to share these types of perspectives, respected perspectives, the lessons, and also the very practical and financial decisions. And we've talked about some of those, the practical things around currency exchange, the practical aspects around uh, e-commerce and student exchange, um, all of these things, very practical, new development bank, what new development bank can do to support countries to access clean energy, all of these sorts of things, very, very practical. But I think the first step is, is the safe space the, and the respected space. And I hope that that could, that could deliver something um, for, for the world at this point and of course help us move towards the SDGs as we started with. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank all of you today. And I know many of you have mentioned that all our countries are facing some challenges. We are facing multiple challenges from economy to pandemic to climate change. And but but we are all facing these problems as humanity, regardless of cultural backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, uh, all this background. So we are, so we come together for not just for BRICS and also different organizations um, such as ASEAN, such as Shanghai Cooperation, organizations such as BRI. So all these different organizations um, help these countries from different regions to work together, to respect each other, to find a solution to all these problems that are facing together. So very interesting perspective that all of you have been shared today uh, from different continents, from different time zones, from I uh, really, really enjoyed it. And I hope our viewers really enjoyed that too. And remember the BRICS Summit kick off this week on Thursday. So stay tuned, eyes on the BRICS and let's all find solutions to solve our common problem common challenges so i hope all of you can have a good night and stay tuned with the chat room on cggn2 so see you guys good night <laughs>